These are three giant bags of trash. This is a trash compactor, and this is what it all looks like after it's been squished by this thing. Now here we have three disks full of graphics files, a file compressor, and here's what it all looks like after it's been squished by the software. Same idea, same problem. Not enough landfill for all our trash, never enough hard disk space for all our files. So today we'll throw out the trash, but we will take a look at the latest in file compression technology on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software, and by PC Connection, and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is Jan Lewis. Jan, on our computer here, we have a file up here you can see called Demo Doc, and it right now takes up about 60K of space. I also have on here a file compression program called LHA. It's a public domain program. You can get it on bulletin boards, and we're in the process of compressing that 60K file right now, and it's almost done. It's going to report out to us how much we've been able to compress that file, and it's done. It's gotten down to 28% of its original size. There's the compressed version of the file. It takes up 17K now. All right, we know there's no free lunch, there's no perpetual motion machine, but where did the 40K go? How do we do this? Uh, well, the general way that these algorithms work is they look for repetitive patterns of bits and they abbreviate them or compress them. Now, clearly, they're going to be trade-offs, yeah. but you, typically the user has some control over what those trade-offs mm -hmm. are. For instance, how much compression do you want? Do you need to compress it by a factor of 40 or a factor of 2, for yeah. instance? A second thing is, what kind of speed do you need to decompress at? For instance, to do full motion video, right. you need 30 frames mm -hmm. a second, and the decompression has to be extremely fast yes. in that case. And then the third thing is, uh, what kind of loss in resolution can you tolerate? Mm -hmm. A good example would be sound files. Yeah. Typically, you can lose some of the frequencies and still come out with good right, sound, right. so you can gain something mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Well, Jen, today we'll look at several different approaches to file compression, software utilities, and hardware add-ons, and we'll squeeze lots of files on a Mac and on a 486 PC. Now when you're dealing with video images, as Jan said, the file size problem and the speed of file decompression really become critical. We're going to start with a visit to Super Mac Technology in Sunnyvale, California to learn about two compression products called Real Time and the Video Spigot. The biggest problem to storing video on the computer would be um, having to uh, compress the video so that it fits on the computer disk, number one. There have been analog solutions in the past where you had just analog video in a window that um, were useful if you had video playing off of a laser disk, but the, the, the point of the matter is, is that you couldn't really do anything with the video. You couldn't manipulate the video nor could you store the video on a disk and import it into other programs. That's why SuperMac developed the video spigot and Realtime. Realtime, R-E-E-L, has actually been renamed Premiere and licensed to Adobe Systems. It's a digital video editor that lets you select video and audio clips, bring them into your Mac, and then add special effects. There are obvious advantages to merging video with computers. Video on the, on the computer at the consumer level would allow you, for example, to shoot some home movies and digitize your home movies and, and work with those on the computer. Take individual picked files out of those movies and perhaps store them and save them in various ways. Premiere is actually a movie construction set working with Apple's QuickTime. The video spigot from SuperMac is a digital frame grabber that lets you capture and compress video images without using up your whole hard drive. While digital video offers some obvious advantages to analog videotape, the folks at SuperMac say it'll be a while before we're all using digital camcorders. Computer-based digital video can only replace videotape when the compression gets great enough and the image quality gets good enough to really make that a reality. I don't think that that's something that would happen in the next year or two. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. We're
We're going to take a look now at two different approaches to file compression on your PC. Here to show us the software solution called PKZip is Mr. PK, Phil Katz, president of PKWare. Also with us to show us a hardware solution is Gary Clow of Stack Electronics. Jan? Gary, in looking at some of these compression products, we see hardware solutions and we see software solutions. Uh, can you explain what's the difference and what are the benefits and advantages to, to both of them? Well, there are actually times where you want to use software. In the case where you don't have a way to get hardware into your system, for instance, on a laptop or notebook machine where there's no way to get hardware mm -hmm. in. Or there are times when you want the hardware for the speed. But basically, it boils down to speed. The hardware gives you the maximum speed. And we're going to see that in just a minute when you show us your yes. stack product. All right, Phil, let's turn to you. And you've got the, the well-known PKZip. And show us how you use it and what it really does here. PKZip is a general purpose archiving utility. It's used on many online systems such as CompuServe. Right. It's also used for distribution of many commercial software programs. Here on the screen I have uh, several different types of files. I have a Windows bitmap file, mm -hmm. I have a database file, and a simple text file. What I'm going to do now is bring up this window and run PKZip to compress those files which I just have shown. Mm -hmm. And PKZip will show the percentage of the files compressed and then the total amount of savings when it's done. And what do we have then? And this is a compressed archive, a zip file created by PKZip. The bitmap file we just compressed, for example, uh, used to be 150K and is now compressed to, to 18K, 89% uh -huh. savings. Yeah. Uh, overall, the zip file contains many different types of files, executable files, database files, a graphic file, and what used to take uh, a little over a megabyte of space is now compressed to about 1.2 megabytes or right, one-tenth right. the original size. Well, actually, 11 megabytes to 1.2, huh? Is that, that that's correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. We also have a utility called PKSFX, which allows someone to take a compressed zip file and turn it into a standard executable file. That way, compressed information can be transferred to somebody who doesn't necessarily have the PKWare utilities, okay. but wishes to save disk space or transfer time. And this is a standard MS-DOS executable which I'm running now, which is actually extracting compressed data from within itself. Okay, what else can we do with this? We also have a utility called PKLite, which can take any standard uh, DOS executable program, uh, any application, and compresses that executable to a, another compressed executable that when you run it, it automatically extracts into memory and runs normally. It allows you to save all your executable programs in a compressed so you format. you can run it from the compressed version. Right, and that's very useful on, on laptops and machines where right. disk space is limited and the executables run just like the original. Uh -huh. And what else does it do? Yeah, a couple more tricks, I think. Uh, well, we have several data compression related products. Uh, one of our newer products is a data compression library which allows any application programmer to integrate our compression technology into their application program. We also have menu driven versions of our software and other compression related utilities. All right, terrific. Phil, if I can ask you to dump out of Windows here so we can turn to Gary now and take a look. Now, you really are using hardware and software in what you do, is do with your stack product, don't you? That's right. We have one version that's software only for laptops and notebooks, and then we have a range of products which have the coprocessor board uh -huh. with our data compression integrated circuit on it. It's actually a data compression coprocessor chip that we've designed ourselves, and we have one for 8-bit systems and XT bus, AT mm -hmm. bus systems, and microchannel systems. All right, I think we've got, the, we're back to the old CPROM tier, and if you can get Stacker up and show us what it does. Great. What I'm going to do is get into our command assistant. This mm -hmm. comes with stack and it enables you to get access to all the stack utility commands that come along. What we're going to do is do an installation here. Now people buy our product because they really want to install another hard disk on their system. Yeah. They really don't have to know about compression or understand data compression. They really just want to add capacity to their system. So I've chosen the option here to install stacker on an empty stacker drive or build an, an empty stack or drive. Now, if you already have data on your hard disk, mm -hmm. you can choose the other option. It will go out there and actually take the data you have existing, move it over to the stacker drive, 
and incrementally build the stacker drive, taking up the old space as the files are deleted. So you don't have to have an empty drive to perform you this? You don't have okay. to. In this case, we've got a 600 megabyte drive with 256 megabytes free. Yeah. I'm just going to do what a typical user might do, take a 20 megabyte segment of a drive. So pretend we had a 20 megabyte drive. That's right. And? We're going to turn it into a 40. Drive, basically. Okay. So I'm going to show everyone how quickly and easily you can install a 40 megabyte drive on your system. I just hit the uh, create install. Now what you see coming up here is the Norton Speed Disk. Yeah. This comes along bundled with our product and it goes out and optimizes your existing disk to make sure that when the stacker drive is created, it's all in a contiguous area on the disk. Right. So uh, you get the maximum performance and that it's way. it's cleaned up the existing drive with the 20 it's, meg. We've done that now and uh, that actually created uh, or actually cleaned up all of the 600 meg drive. Uh -huh. Okay, now you have to actually reboot the system and it does this automatically for you. And the reason is we operate as a device driver. Mm -hmm. We're a DOS device driver and what that means is that the compression happens automatically and transparently. It gives you a new drive to use just as you would a DOS drive. Mm -hmm. So there are no commands to run to compress files or decompress files. All files are kept compressed on the drive, and the effect, of course, is double the capacity right, right. on your disk. Okay, we hear it rebooting now, and let's see what's happened here. Basically, then you'll be issuing commands that are DOS commands fundamentally, and it will transparently be doing the compression. That's exactly right. And you've just seen how hard it is to install a 40 <laughs> megabyte drive okay, on your well, system. Okay, go ahead, let's prove it. So now we've got a D drive, and uh -huh. that's our new drive. I'm going to show you the DOS check disk. You can see it Indeed, says right there, megabyte 40 megabyte drive. drive. Yeah. I'm going to copy a bunch of files uh, from the C drive in the stack directory over to this D drive. Now, you may not realize what's happening, but you see those file names clicking across mm -hmm. there. That was a megabyte of files, actually. And each time it was writing one of those files, it was, doing it was, all the compression right it was there. compressing the mm -hmm. entire the file. Mm -hmm. So you can see uh -huh. how fast it is. That was okay. a megabyte of files there. Now, what we have, I've shown you a DOS dir. If yeah. you just put an S in front of it and do DIR, you see on the rightmost column there that that's the compression ratio for each file. Right. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see the actual compression ratio for the entire directory. Mm -hmm. Now people say, this must be too good to tr be true. I don't see any difference here. I just have more capacity. Yeah. Let me show you exactly uh, how this works and the fact that this is exactly like a DOS disk. I'm going to go in and edit one of these files. Okay. I have a letter.txt down at the bottom, and there's a little program called sedit that comes with Stacker. I'm going to call it up. Now, I'd like you to measure how long it takes to read this file okay. because it's in compressed form. We're actually going, going to decompress, decompress it. it. So I'm going to load the program and decompress okay. this file. So when you see it thrown up on the screen, the entire file's been decompressed. I'm so ready? Ready? Start. Okay, stop your watch. <laughs> That's how fast it is. Start it. it. <laughs> okay. Okay, just to prove that we've actually done something here, I'm going to show you how fast it actually uh, compresses data because we're going to modify it. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to... Uh, change this to the okay. Stacker 2.0. Uh -huh. All right, now I'm going to save this file, and when it does, it'll have to recompress the entire file. file. There it goes, and it's back to the DOS prompt. Oh. Gary, you used SEDIT, which is your program. If you had used an independent application, let's say WordPerfect on that file, and WordPerfect had also been compressed, how, would that have also done it? Would it be fast? Sometimes they actually load faster, in fact, mm. so, because it's taking uh, less revolutions of the disk. It takes half the space on the disk. Mm -hmm. And given that you're doing it in real time, there's mm -hmm. no added latency, especially on read operations. Oh, now let's quick. see if you really did save that new file. Okay, now somewhere in here I've got yeah, the stacker it. down yeah, at the bottom. Yeah, it is a different file. So I'm going to actually go in there and uh, delete that put it back where it was, I'm actually rewriting it again. So if I run the directory, you see the file there. Now I'm going to show you how compatible we are with DOS. Let me actually erase that same file. Okay, I'm going to run SDIR again, you see it's not there. Now I'm going to call up Norton Unerase. Sure enough, it found it. So I'm going to cursor over here, say Unerase it. It needs the first letter, I supply it, as le it's recovered. We'll get out and I'll do an SDIR again. There it is. Just so you know, there, there's no mirrors. There it is. <laughs> Gary, Phil, thank you very much. Both very impressive. Well, the trouble with wonderful, colorful graphic images is they take up a lot of disk space and a lot of access time. At the Seabold Desktop Publishing Conference held recently in San Jose, we took a look at several new compression products designed especially for graphics files. Computer users want file compression utilities so they can save storage space and transfer time. Here at the Siebold Conference, the 25,000 attendees saw a wide range of products that do just that. Transfer time is the problem when you need to transmit an image across a network or across the world. Storm Technology was showing off one solution to that problem. 
Newspapers work with deadlines. They want to get their information there as quickly as possible. So when Gorbachev, the coup was in Moscow, there were people ready there to have the pictures, compress them, send them over, so that we have this information as soon as possible available for us in the next edition of the newspaper. But for many computer applications, quality is just as important as time. At the handmade software booth, they were saying you can get both. For example, a normal 640 by 480 file that you've scanned in would be about a megabyte in size. Well, compressing the file using JPEG compression lowers the file size to anywhere between 20 and 1 20th and 1 25th of the size. So now you're talking to having a file which is maybe 40K. Well, sending a 40K file over a modem is obviously preferable to sending a 1 megabyte file. There has to be a trade-off for that degree of file compression. But Daniel Kemp of Radius says the quality you lose is virtually unnoticed if you use the right products. Well, there, the drawbacks uh, are obvious that you lose data when you compress, but the, uh, the benefit to that is you can get almost exactly the same quality. You're going to lose, of course, the user chooses between image quality and compression ratio. Uh, but you can get almost the same quality at a fraction of the image size. The newest generation of file compression products aimed at the graphics market tries to solve the time versus quality problem by giving the user control over what parts of a graphic image file to compress. Another very important feature is that it really allows you to select different areas within the pictures so you, you as a user can decide which area you want to have the most quality. This is very important if you, for example, have text and logos in pictures where you really want to have the best quality and as a user you really want to select that. The file compression products here at the Seabold conference range from software solutions to hardware add-ins. The software approach is cheaper, the hardware approach is faster. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Maria Gabriel. For Macintosh users, there are several good file compression products, and here to show us Stuff It Deluxe is David Shargle of Aladdin Systems, and also with us, Marshall Goldberg of Sigma Designs, who will demonstrate Double Up. Jan? Marshall, earlier we saw some PC compression products. Now we're going to be seeing Mac ones. Now, is there something about the Macintosh or Nubus that makes it harder, easier, different, uh, or are there things that you have to take into account when you implement a product? Well, basically they're the same. Of course, you need Macintosh software and uh, good Macintosh engineers, which we have, uh, but it's very similar to how the, the two work together. In the new bus? Mm -hmm. In new bus or in a different yeah. Macintosh. PDS. All right, let, let's turn to Stuff It Deluxe then, David, and a lot of us are familiar with Stuff It from, from early uh, shareware days. Show us the new product and what it can do. What I was going to illustrate is one of the major differences between the earlier versions and this current version, yeah. which is the Magic Menu Finder extension. Mm -hmm. What we allow you to do is be at the Macintosh Finder and select any file or folder or a combination of those. In this case, I'm going to choose a folder that has a number of graphic documents and we're processing documents. And I'm going to go to the Magic Menu and select the Stuff command. What's going to happen now is that Stuff It Deluxe is automatically going to appear and begin compressing all those files, maintaining the directories or folders, mm -hmm. and compress it into a single archive. What we're then able to do is go into that archive if we so choose. We can send it right off to somebody. Or in the case what I'm going to do now, here's our new archive. By double clicking on it, we're going to go into the Stuff It Deluxe application. Mm -hmm. I'm going to illustrate that we can manipulate these archives. Here is the window that appears with our documents folder. And inside here are the other items that appeared. One of the mechanisms for manipulating an archive is that I can create multiple archives. In this case, I'm going to create a file that I'm going to send to an output service. Mm -hmm. And I can simply take the graphic documents that I needed to send and drag them into the other folder. Mm -hmm. We're also able to rename, copy, move things within the archives. And if your service bureau doesn't have stuff, at, can you make them self-extracting as you do the copy? Yes, you can. It adds a little bit of overhead to the file. But most service bureaus who are using Macintosh have Stuff It or Unstuff It, which mm -hmm. is a freeware product yeah. of ours. We also provide compression optimizers, which enhance the compression of specific file formats. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on what kind of file you're dealing with, you use a different approach. Exactly. For example, sound files or Photoshop files, which can get fairly large. Mm -hmm. We also include a JPEG module for 24-bit graphic compression. 
David, for users who might find this a little bit complicated, is, is there a, an online help that sort of guides you through this process? We have something that is called online documentation. Uh -huh. We basically provide almost the entire manual online uh -huh. that's readily accessible, both the magic menu or in the application itself. Okay, great. I'm going to ask you to get out of Stuff It if you can and slide the mouse over to Marshall so that we can uh, take a look at Double Up. While he's doing that, Marshall, you've got a board there. Once again, we're going from a pure mm -hmm. software solution to a software hardware solution and, and describe what's on the card. Well, Double Up is a new bus card that will work in any two Mac 2 series computer. It uses the stack compression chip for very fast compression. Mm -hmm. uh, we've married that to a really nice program called Disk Doubler, which makes compression very easy on the Macintosh. So between the ease of use and the speed, you can compress mm -hmm. everything on the drive, giving it double the capacity. And sort of getting back to Jan's question, it's really the same stack chip we saw when we were showing off the PC uh -huh. before, huh? Yes, exactly. Okay, well, show us Double Up and what you can do with it. Sure. Here's a folder full of files that I made with Microsoft Word. Um, I can select one of these files or even the whole folder full of files and, com and select Compress from the mm -hmm. Disk Doubler menu. When I do, Disk Doubler quickly uses the board to compress everything in the folder. Now, once they're compressed, the files look exactly as they did before, except that the DD appears in the icon so you can tell that it's been compressed with the program. Now, in addition, I can select an entire folder, in this case, the, the Microsoft Word, Word Processing Program, and I can compress everything that's in the folder. Mm -hmm. Well, now what can happen is this. I can take one of the files I've compressed, such as this one. When I double click on it to start the program, Disk Doubler comes in, expands the file, expands Microsoft Word, and mm -hmm. starts the program for me automatically. It does it so easily and so fast that I can compress everything, letting me get more capacity. Now if I select Open from the File menu, which is a standard way that Mac users mm -hmm. open up files, all the compressed files appear like normal. So I can pick any one of these, for instance this large file, and it automatically expands and opens up for me. So once again, from the user's point of view, it can be totally transparent. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Now when I quit the program again, everything will automatically recompress. Mm -hmm. Okay, what else? Well, in addition to being very simple to use, there's one small settings box. And I can open it through the DD menu and select mm -hmm. settings. This can let me use uh, a software method, which is built into Disk Doubler, right. or the method smallest, which tries all three methods to give me the absolutely smallest result, which is usually the board. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I can select the file verification feature, which reads back everything that was sent to the disk to be absolutely sure that every byte of data uh -huh. is safe. Uh -huh. um, we, we recommend this for SciQuest drives, for instance. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a companion product, we include Disk Checker, which is a program that you can run to test mm -hmm. your hard disk drives to be sure that they're operating correctly. Okay. David, now Marshall is just talking about three different approaches in his program. You had an optimizer where you were talking about different approaches. Uh, Jan, at the very beginning of the program, explained the, the fundamental principle of the algorithm that does compress files. Why do we need three or seven different, different ways of doing this? Usually there's a direct trade-off in the amount of speed versus yeah. compression. And there's a number of different algorithms that are available that uh, offer those types of compromises. Usually when you're doing telecommunications, you want to have the most compact files. Right. Well, if you're doing something like saving disk space, the speed is very important. Mm -hmm. All right, now, Marshall, uh, speaking of the trade-offs, uh, it seems to be all good news we've heard. I mean, you just magically turn 20 meg drives into 40 meg drives, do all this. I mean, there's got to be some downside, some risk, some, some negative to this, isn't there? Oh, no, not at all. In fact, the most important thing to developing the product is to make sure that it's reliable and safe. Mm -hmm. uh, the algorithm we use, LempelZiv, has been around since the early 70s the same ones you've seen on the PC products, and we rigorously test the product. We use the tests like checksum uh, and temporary files, mm -hmm. so that even if the power is disrupted to the computer while it's compressing or expanding, the files are completely safe, mm -hmm. in addition to the disk checker program, which we include for safety and verification media. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Both very impressive. That is our look at file compression. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news on Random Access. Random Access file this week, IBM has introduced a new clone killer, a 386SX version of the PS1. The new system comes with a 16 MHz 386 processor, VGA color monitor, 40 MB hard drive, 2 MB of RAM, internal 2400 baud modem, Microsoft Works, and a Prodigy subscription. Retail price is $1,699. IBM is also going after the laptop competition. Big Blue has slashed the price of its PS2 model 
Dell L40 laptop by about 25 percent. The price is now $3,995, down from $5,245. IBM is also cutting prices on laptop accessories and memory upgrades. The strange bedfellows IBM and Apple returned from the altar last week with details of their new romance. The two companies announced five major areas in which they will jointly develop new technology. Leading the list is multimedia computers, object-oriented software, new network utilities to make it easier to link Macs and IBM compatibles, and a new operating platform that will work across both systems using RISC hardware. In a big boost for Motorola, Apple and IBM said they would jointly develop a new microprocessor based on the Motorola Power PC chip, a single-chip RISC CPU. Apple and IBM said they plan to use the chip in their future personal computers and workstations. With fall Comdex just around the corner, there are lots of new products being announced. Compaq heads the list with a new color laptop called the 486C. In addition to a 486 processor and 256 color capability, the new Compaq comes with a 120 megabyte hard drive and a standard 4 megs of RAM. The Compaq 486C portable runs on AC only. The company says the computer is aimed at the technical market. List price is just under $10,000. Slate Systems has taken the next step toward the electronic book by introducing PenBook, a new electronic publishing system designed for pen-based computers. The system will run on an IBM or a Macintosh and includes the pen author and pen reader utilities, which can convert any PostScript file to be readable on a pen-based computer screen. Slate says it will be as easy to read a pen book document on Slate screen as it is to read it on paper in a book. Well, Grid Systems has just announced the first internal 9600 baud modem for laptop computers. The new Grid modem is both a data and fax modem. It will also work in the new Grid Pen computer. Price is about $1,000. It's due to ship shortly after Comdex. Taking a look at this week's top 10 software titles for the Mac, Mac Connection reports that Norton Utilities for the Mac is in the number one position, with Quicken 3.0 for the Mac in second. Third is After Dark and More After Dark Bundle, followed by Microsoft Flight Simulator and After Dark 2.0U. Rounding out the top 10 Mac titles are Sam, Kid Picks, Disc Doubler, More After Dark, and In It Picker from Microseeds. Finally, with Ashton Tate about to be taken over by Borland, the dreaded pink slips made the rounds last week. Ashton Tate announced layoffs of about 8% of the staff, about 100 employees. All the layoffs were at Ashton Tate's headquarters in Torrance, California. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Maria Gabriel. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software, and by PC Connection, and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. The Computer Chronicles provides a free kit to help you review the contents of your company's hard disks and ensure the ethical use of software. For a free self-audit program, write to The Computer Chronicles, Box 2954, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 17105.